And red just has attention. Get your attention. Okay. All righty. Announcements. That's not my thing. Sermon here. I didn't get rid of that flag. Good morning. It's been a while since I have shared. John asked me during the time when we were all at home, uh, but I, uh, I was not able to really do a video uh, sermon too well. And uh, I also realized I don't have PowerPoint on a computer at home anymore. But Mary has it on her laptop. So, <laughs> But I, got, I was able to put this together. Great. And we're going to be talking about our compassionate father. <clears throat> and uh, okay, so it is Father's Day, and this message is about our Heavenly Father's compassion. I'll also be talking about our earthly father, kind of relating and looking at, into the compassion that we as fathers, uh, you know, might give to our, our, our family, our children. And I'm hoping by the end we get through this whole message that, you know, we'll be able to be able to realize that God wants us to look to him, follow his role, example of being compassionate. First, you may be questioning his compassion given the recent coronavirus pandemic. So this is what got me thinking about compassion. It's like some people question when, you know, bad things happen in the world, how is God's compassion there? And he provides uh, for us in many ways. The scripture has whole lists of things that we need to praise God for and be com- that he uh, does out of his compassion for us. And one thing that I learned as I was studying this, and I shared with Mary, it's like a little bit more of what motivates God's compassion toward us. So we'll talk about that. In recent months, the, the world literally came to stop. People suffer through the illness, and many even died because of it. And as of now, there's nearly this number I looked at was yesterday, I guess, 465,000 deaths from the coronavirus. Uh, Malaria still kills over 600,000 annually, and influenza is also near that amount annually. And then there's all these other diseases out there, and illnesses, and cancers. And, you know, and I think about, uh, it kind of makes you think about human life is fragile. And just something really simple, and then it's gone. Tells us here, Scripture, Bible says, our life is like a vapor. Here one moment, and gone the next. I told you my opening slide was going to be a downer. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) but anyway, um, uh, so we endure pain and suffering, and even more so, the older we get. Man, every day I get up in the morning, I'm feeling really good. <clears throat> and then by lunchtime, man, I'm starting to get sore. And then by 3 o'clock near the end of the day, oh, my, my back is killing me. And I get home and I can barely sit down. And, so, and, and then if I stay in a position for too long, I get so stiff and pain. As so I go home and I have to take pain medicine. <sighs> and then I'm thinking, <laughs> thank you, Lord, for, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, uh. I enjoy the work I do. And so the older I get, I have to be more careful because when you get older, uh, your body doesn't heal quite as quickly anymore and you're more prone to uh, injury and um, oftentimes, too, uh, your equilibrium can get off and, uh, <clears throat> and that can be dangerous uh, when you fall. So I'm, I have to be more careful is what I'm getting at. <laughs> So you might ask, does God really care about me? Yeah, you know, God does. The scripture is very clear all throughout. That we, uh, we serve a, a compassionate father. God uh, is very concerned and, uh, and loves us. And he, he's compelled to, uh, to love. His word to us, recorded in the Bible, gives us hope in this life and assures us that there is more to our existence than just this human flesh. This scripture tells us that it's like a temporary dwelling for our spirit, for our soul. A tent, even, some might say. So my message today shows that God does care. So, uh, you know, as if that all wasn't an intro, uh, Often we see in Scripture that God is being compared 
to her earthly fathers. Uh, I feel that this is a little unfair towards God and sometimes towards, our, towards, our, towards me as father, uh, earthly fathers since God is so much greater in every way than any human could ever hope to be. But yet, the scripture, uh, the you know, Bible authors, uh, as they're writing and compelled and, and led on by the Spirit to record uh, the scriptures for us, God, they have to compare. They have to get ways for us to understand God. He's trying. To, so this, this, the Bible is helping us to understand the God we serve, the God who created us, our Father. And so the only terminology that we really understand is human interaction, human relationships. And God isn't human. Uh, God is so much other than human, uh, but yet it's, it's really the only thing we understand. And, but God's uh, characteristic qualities come across, and we are often reading that, you know, we have human qualities attributed to God. Uh, and that's okay, because we understand those. Uh, and God uses that uh, to help us along. Uh, oftentimes, I, it, this is one of the things I was getting in here. Um, it, I was reading another commentary about it. Uh, anyway, well, I'll get to it. But in these comparisons, we must consider that God is, you know, that God being perfect in character has called us to be like him. How can we measure up to God? God as a father, God as a loving, kind, compassionate father. Uh, we have so much baggage in our life. And I, think, and I think about, you know, myself striving towards God's example, and I fail. And I think back to my dad and my formative years growing up uh, and how my dad failed sometimes and you know we can all think back those <clears throat> to those kind of you know memories but uh today we're looking at our compassionate father he is he's our example that we need to uh live uh and imitate so the focal passage is in psalm 103 now really psalm 103 is an awesome psalm and it's all about praising God. And I wish I could have, you know, have done the whole thing. Maybe, I, I don't know. I'm, but there's a lot of verses in there, a lot of songs, um, choruses that we sing that come out of Psalm 103. And uh, also in here is the verse that talks about God takes our sins and puts them as far as the east is from the west. And that comes out of here. Uh, and just, you know, praising God with all my, with all that is within me. Praise his name. That comes out of here. Um, and others. But verse 13, I think, is a focal here a little bit in this psalm. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. And then I put 14 in here. Because of some commentary said, this is why God's compassionate. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. That's why he's compassionate toward us, because he knows our limits, and yet he wants us to be like him. Really? <laughs> God provides. Some people call it God's con condescending love. You know, God is so much greater than us, and we are like a speck, a dust. But he chooses to love that. He chooses to love us, and he has compassion towards our frailty to provide. So our outline here, just through those two verses, a father's compassion, so part A, part B, part C of that, of verse 13, a Lord's compassion, the fear of God. I'm going to talk about the fear of God and, well, I'm going to actually get into uh, the he, some of the Hebrew words on these. The, the Hebrew word for compassion, Hebrew word for fear. And then our frailty and God's love. So a father's compassion, as a father shows compassion to his children, Psalm 103, 13. Um, again, comparing. So as a father shows compassion, so God shows compassion likewise. Now, it's interesting because 
If you did not grow up with a compassionate father, that's not the father that God is being compared to. Uh, it's understood, the author here, um, the psalmist, whether it's David, possibly, that is writing this, is drawing upon the fact that a father ought to have compassion for his children. And that this is the compassion that we see. God is our father. Israel is his children as they follow him. And also in, in this uh, verse where it talks about those who fear him, referring to irreverent fear, uh, fear even in the sense of respect, like a child shows respect to their dad by obeying him and listening and following him. <clears throat> so the Hebrew uh, word, racham, to have compassion, be merciful, or pity. Now some tra uh, translations use the word pity in, in this verse. I don't like the word pity because to me pity does not necessarily promote action in the sense it just kind of, it's an emotion of more disdain in a sense. It's almost a, like a, people say, oh, I just don't want your pity. I don't want, <laughs> well, that's not it. Oftentimes, the one who's a receiver of compassion wants the compassion. <clears throat> Desires it even. So, uh, in its noun form, uh, and Pastor John has m shared this many times in his sermons, how this compassion has originates about of the bowels uh, and the womb and mercy kind of like wells up from within, deep inside. And as many scripture talks about uh, being deeply moved. Sometimes that's how it's translated, this very word, uh, just being deeply moved uh, with love, with concern or, you know, an action. Uh, compels us to do something about someone else's, uh, you know, difficulty or circumstances. But as I was reading this and looking into it and uh, studying into the Hebrew, uh, they say that in its original, older, archaic forms, some of the, some of the, you know, as far back as you go, things get lost. As far as the, you know, translation, what was really meant by this word? Well, it's used a few different ways. Um, and oftentimes they say that it started from a, the womb. Speaking of a mother's compassion, mother, the way a mother is towards the protecting their uh, young, uh, their baby, maybe unborn infant or a newborn infant and how the mother has compassion for that, would do anything for it, and protecting it, and uh, just loving it, and seeing that it's so frail, so fragile, and, uh, and just has, you know, unimaginable love and hope for it in its, you know, as it grows up. So you nurture it and love it. Um, I thought that was pretty cool. And then also as a father to a child, oh, you know, God to mankind, and then I was thinking, okay, well, what really is compassion? You know, I'm looking up, uh, so dictionary.com on the internet says this, compassion is a feeling of deep sympathy and sorrow for another who is stricken by misfortune, but it's accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate their suffering. So, so it's a, it, it, it spurs us really on to do something. So, there's a number of passages or examples in scripture of people who haven't compassion. So the, uh, the, 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 um, the Good Samaritan uh, story, <clears throat> the, the one who helped had compassion on, on, the, on, the, on the one who had been uh, you know, injured or, uh, and you know, provided help. Whereas the others in that story, uh, parable, that they did not, and normally they were the ones who should have, uh, Jesus shares. And he says that we are to go and do likewise, you know, offering love and compassion and helping. And uh, also, well, let me get in here. I'll talk about this. Another compassion uh, that we see is the compassionate father in the prodigal son. A story. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. 
So while studying this passage, I began to think of my father and whether he showed compassion toward me. I, I say, and whether he showed compassion to me, whether or not, at different times in my life. And, and it's kind of hard to think back. And I'm sure my dad did show compassion to me, you know, many times. And I can think of, you know, a few. Uh, but then, uh, but they don't really stand out all that much. And I also know that my dad struggled with anger and rage. And as he uh, was trying to be compassionate and help me during uh, difficulties, Sometimes I just didn't get things. He was trying to tell, teach me or help me, and then he would get frustrated with me, and then there goes that compassion, you know. And I, and I, I he, so he had a real short uh, temper, uh, and uh, and so I oftentimes just, you know, I love my dad and want to be like him, and but there's times when I just kind of push that negative trait that he has away and just say, well, he had a bad day. He come home from work and he's like dealing with, my mom told me this before too, about the difficulty that my dad had uh, at Ford Motor Company and coming home and taking it out on me, on, on his kids. Ugh. You know, a lot of fathers do that. They come home and they take out their anger from their day on their kids or something. Um, Mary told me times that uh, her and her sisters uh, were being unruly at home, and, uh, and then their dad comes home, and their mom wants him to punish them, <laughs> and he's not there while well, they were being unruly or just, you know, not doing things right. And, uh, but Mary also told me how her dad oftentimes was uncaring, and he'd just come home and drink himself till he passed away. Till he passed out on the couch. <laughs> uh, and I said, well, that's like an absent father. And then also Mary was telling me uh, how her dad uh, always uh, worked so many hours. He'd work weekends. He tried to work every holiday um, <clears throat> because uh, in his mind, it's, well, that's extra money, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, uh, and, and my dad worked weird shifts too and different things. And it's like, I would, uh, I'd be at home. And it's like, I'm struggling with uh, schoolwork and my mom doesn't know how to do anything. She, <laughs> she says, you have to ask your dad. It's like, dad's not very compassionate. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so you may have memories of when your father showed you compassion growing up. And uh, if you had a father who was very compassionate, wonderful. And that's a good role model. And in this scripture passage, God is being compared to a father like that. A father who cared, who gave time, who uh, never was, or his time was never more important to him than his children's time. Uh, sometimes I feel that I can be selfish with my time, even though my time that I'm thinking of might be, you know, my own recreational time. Kids, get away. I'm like doing something fun. <laughs> uh, just go to your room and, you know, leave me alone. But then, you know, well, that's not being good and fatherly. Yep. Anyway, so I try to be a compassionate father, but I fear I fall short at times. And the truth is, well, we all do. You know, we try. It is our, it's in our nature, one of our many weaknesses to which God meets us with compassion. And we're going to talk about our weaknesses. Uh, and it is those weaknesses, being human, that compels God to have compassion for us. And one most important weakness is sin, which God provides a way past. As believers, our role model for being a compassionate father can only be our Heavenly Father. And Scripture is full of examples of how God uh, was compassionate to Israel. He was long-suffering and patient. And he, uh, but not just compassionate and loving, but God was also just, true. He was faithful. He was also uh, demanding. And uh, things had to be done specifically the way he uh, ordained them, the way he, you know, instructed. Uh, and, you know, God's, God's perfect. And so, he calls us to be, to follow him in that. Uh, so how can, you know, 
but yet God's compassionate and loving. Uh, we see that we, as we study the scripture. So then he says, so, so the Lord shows compassion. You know, likewise, like the, like the earthly father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion. And the rest of the verse, uh, to those who fear him. Um, so one of God's character traits, compassion, merciful, mercy, compassion, pretty much uh, oftentimes comes from the same uh, root in the Hebrew. So this was revealed to Moses on the mountain when God describes himself as he passed before him. Moses required, no, Moses asked God or pleaded with God to, you know, show himself to him. Uh, you know, who are you, God? And so uh, Moses kind of hid in a cleft of the mountain and as God came by and God pretty much explained to Moses God, his character, what type of God he was. And uh, in Exodus 34, 6, you can read that. I don't have those verses. But in this psalm, the psalmist in, included some of that. So he made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. God made himself known by the things he did, his character and so forth. So in verse 8, it says, The Lord is merciful. God said this to Moses, that he is a Lord merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And uh, um, that's out of uh, Exodus 34, 6, but I don't, didn't include, it didn't include verse 7, but that goes on. <clears throat> In the well-known parable, sometimes called the compassionate father, uh, more often the prodigal son, Jesus paints a word picture for us, depicting a father acting compassionately toward his formerly lost son who has just come home. Uh, it is a picture of how God, as our father, acts toward us as his children. You know, and it's not necessarily a picture that we are to do likewise as our father or as being a father as this father did to his children. It's more or less to help us understand God's love, God's compassion toward us. Um, how he, how he, in his mind, his son was dead to him, gone, lost. He had no idea. And then he's back. And his son pretty much was thinking, my, I'll just come and work as a servant for my dad, hopefully. Uh, and then when he comes home, it was almost like um, he was just, you know, embraced and it was all forgiven. <clears throat> God's compassion for mankind, <clears throat> given our plight, our circumstances, our, you know, dismal life, if you will, <laughs> it drives him to act on our behalf for good. Because God is capable of so much good. We can do good, but we have no way of changing our plight in life. We can't forgive our own sin. For God has to do that. We can't. There's a whole bunch of things. Uh, so we are told also in 1 Peter 5, 7, to cast all of our anxieties on him because he cares for us. You know, God really cares for us. And we are asked to do this. Similarly uh, worded throughout scripture. Putting all your concerns on God because he cares. He cares. You don't have to carry all that baggage. You don't have to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. You know, God sees us and God knows our limits. And, uh, and God is offering to help. That's his compassion. So God has compassion on us when we fall he helps us up again. And I'm thinking back to times when uh, I was learning how to ride a bicycle. <laughs> My dad was there trying to help me. And uh, so learning how to ride a bicycle, and then we moved to some other house, and I wasn't really good at riding my bicycle yet. 
So then we started, we lived on a dirt road. So I first learned how to ride a bicycle on pavement. And then I started learning how to ride a bicycle on dirt road. It was a little bit harder because the tires can slip more on the stones. And uh, anyway, so I'm learning how to, my dad's there with me. And I'm unable to turn the, the bicycle. And I'd go right into the raspberry bushes. <laughs> and as, if you know, some raspberry bushes have thorns on them. <laughs> and I just fell right in there. <laughs> my dad comes out. Hey, that was one of the times he had compassion on me. <laughs> and uh, we got right back up and did it again. But uh, it was cool. <clears throat> when we are sick or wounded, he comforts us and he heals. And when we lack knowledge, he instructs us in wisdom. God calls, tells us, instructs us, hey, call to me. I will tell you great Unsearchable things you do not even know. <laughs> he, says, he says that, uh, you know, if we lack wisdom, we should ask God for it. Um, scripture, uh, God wants to teach us. So when we uh, offend, when we sin, when we fail, he forgives as we acknowledge our offense. Um, he forgives. And some, some earthly fathers have a hard time forgiving. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have a hard time forgiving. Oftentimes people have a hard time forgiving themselves as well. And when we are wronged, he helps to make, to make it right. God finds a way to correct sometimes when people have wronged us, when things have been, you know, uh, have happened and, and we've been wronged. God is there to comfort and help. And in many other ways, he acts out of compassion to better our life. Uh, God cares. And then the scripture says, he has compassion on those who fear God. To those who fear him. So I'm going to talk about the word fear. So in Hebrew, the word yar can mean a psychological fear that just, just, being afraid and frightened, uh, as in being afraid of something that could hurt you. Sometimes uh, fear of death. Sometimes uh, fear of doing something that could possibly, if you slip, could lead to death. <laughs> and so this fear is a good thing because it preserves your life. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, so then, uh, first of all, let's talk about fear of our earthly fathers. Yes, some fathers instill fear in their children. No, this is not the father that God okay, is being compared to. They force children to obey, not out of love, but from self-preservation. The child is preserving themselves by doing what the father wants them to do, not out of love, but because of the fact that they're frightened and uh, it's a psychological fear motivation that can damage the psyche of a child. Um, and this uh, can be a, uh, a form, or is a form also of um, um, abuse. And uh, unfortunately, some fathers out there who, uh, they struggle. They don't know how to be a dad. They never had a dad. <clears throat> but uh, God is not that father. This is a father who has lost his way, does not understand how compassion and mercy compels one to love and obedience. I was reading another commentary on, on compassion and mercy and how powerful it is to motivate uh, a response <clears throat> from the object that's receiving that compassion uh, of love and obedience. So our Heavenly Father... You know, we love him. We, we, we want to obey. We want to follow. We want to love God. Why? Well, it's because he's compassionate and caring. And he wants to give us all these good things. But in our context here, this fear must produce an obedience out of love, not an obedience out of fear for their life. You know, <clears throat> that's not what 
that's not what this passage is talking about. So then, this is more. Second, not only can uh, it mean a psychological fear, but the same Hebrew word can also mean reverent fear, a fear of awe, like standing in awe in the presence of greatness. It is an acknowledging and giving respect to one in a position of power and authority, realizing that they are above you, that they have power over you, um, like a child uh, respecting their father because their father is in a place of authority. That's how the scripture, that's how uh, it ought to be. I don't know. Today, fathers don't uh, seem to earn their children's respect or even, uh, I mean, they might demand the respect, but it's, I don't know, it's, it's hard. <clears throat> and, uh, and we see that today in family dynamics that's just uh, everything's skewed and messed up. But God, God wants to create, or God wants to repair that in our lives and in our relationships. And so we need to look to Scripture to see where we're going wrong and make those corrections. So those who do not acknowledge God's power and authority over them do not fear God. They don't fear him. So why would they want to respect him or follow him? They, don't, they do not see God's compassion and mercy, for they are not his children. They are lost. I want to make sure here that we don't just, because scripture is very clear that God has compassion for the lost. Even though they haven't gotten to that point of fearing God yet, God has compassion for them. For the very fact that they're lost, <clears throat> he's compassionate. And he has provided mercy for them. They simply need to fear him, to reach out. Those who fear God acknowledge and respect his position of power and authority and receive his compassion and mercy. And God is willing and, and, and uh, wants to uh, give us all good things, his compassion and mercy, uh, God wants that to flow to us. In verse 18 of this psalm, it says that they also keep the covenant and follow the commandments. So they obey. They follow God. They obey his word. And, and, uh, and that is also in a sense of fearing, uh, fearing God because we, we obey him. And also in Scripture, we're told that uh, our obedience to God is love. That's us loving him. That's us loving our Father because we obey. So then, lastly, our frailty and God's love. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are just dust. He created us from the dust of the earth. The reason for his compassion. He knows just how weak we truly are. And then going back to how he started, talking about, you know, the pandemics that, and then throughout history, all the major pandemics that have come and gone. And, uh, you know, something so simple and small has, you know, can just bring human life to almost a standstill. And, you know, it's, it's just questionable how, uh, not questionable, but it's just, um, now I guess I can just read this part. <laughs> the world, uh, what I'm going to say is it's fearful. It, and I wrote how, how it's amazing and frightening. The world was recently brought to its knees during the coronavirus pandemic. It is amazing and frightening how a small virus, you know, can remind us of our frailty and just how weak our life truly is. Uh, and, and, you know, one life is weak, but when you look at, like, things that can affect all of humanity. So I was reading, I was watching, there's a book uh, series, or it's a book. Anyway, so there was a TV series called The Last Ship. I don't know if anyone's ever seen that, The Last Ship. And it's kind of about a worldwide pandemic, and uh, 80% of the world has been killed off because of a virus. And uh, so this ship uh, is out at sea looking for a cure. And, you know, the whole world has changed by the time months later this ship comes back and the whole world, all the world's governments have collapsed. 
It's just uh, chaos, <clears throat> and yet uh, they have the cure. Uh, it's an interesting uh, concept, but the science in that uh, virus <laughs> and coming with the cure, that's not quite accurate in the real world, but interesting show. Uh, so we are weak. We are weak in many ways. Being human, we are prone to sin, temptation, injury, sickness, death, forgetfulness, and even more so the older I get, I seem, it seems, uh, and fear, and that list goes on, in all the many ways that we are weak in comparison to God. You know, that compels God out of compassion because God wants to provide us ways to get past all these weaknesses. And yet, um, he loves us. Okay. He loves us nonetheless. Our days are numbered, Scripture tells us, and we can't change our human plight. Scripture tells us that uh, we're incapable to add another day to our life uh, and so forth. But uh, as much as we would want to change our situation, uh, we can't. We are, of ourselves, incapable of being righteous of ourselves and holy like God requires and are in desperate need of a Savior. And that, you know, Scripture talks about how, how God has provided us, out of his compassion, a way of getting past the sin through Jesus. So Psalm 103, verse 17 now but the steadfast love of God, of the Lord, is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. God's love, everlasting to everlasting. Um, eons to eon. Talking about never ending, perpetual, going on and on. 1 John 3 1, I, one of my favorite verses. <clears throat> Uh, which I memorized in the King James originally. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. I like the way that King James writes that one. A lot of other translations, I don't know. But uh, look at how great a love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And that is what we are. We are God's children. We are just dust, but God loves us. And he has offered us adoption into his kingdom to receive all the blessings that he has <clears throat> for us. Praise the Lord for his great love. You know, I think, it's like, why does God choose to love us? I don't earn that love. I can't earn that love. Nobody can earn God's love. As much as I try, you know, Apostle Paul says that all of his good deeds are like filthy rags to God. Anything that we do that is good, so we think, oh yeah, all I have to do is live a good life and God will forgive me for other things. No, that's not the way it works. God forgives us through Jesus. And Jesus is his compassion, his mercy to us. We may be weak, but he is strong. Therefore, we are to praise God. So this entire psalm is a call, this is my last slide, maybe one last one after this. This entire psalm is a call to praise God for his compassionate mercies. Okay, yeah. So the psalmist began this psalm with a list of mercies to praise God for. So, you know, I, I just want to encourage you to read through Psalm 103 later today, just, you know, or at some point in your quiet time, read through Psalm 103. You know, it's full of great uh, things that we can you know, praise God for and just uh, realize his love for us. So in verse 2 it says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. So this is out of the New Living Translation. So it kind of reads a little differently. New Living Translation, I didn't put that in there. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. 
And the Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. So then, you know, goes through the rest of the psalm, and then the psalmist closes at the end of the psalm with a call for praise because all that God has done for us and how his compassion was so great and that, um, that he has taken our sins, our failures, and has separated them from us as far as the east is from the west. That's in verse 12, by the way. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he calls the angels to even praise God for that. And even everything that God has made is to praise God. Praise the Lord. So let us just praise the Lord for his goodness. So I want to close with this. Uh, we can pray this. And so uh, God... God, we just praise you. We thank you, Lord God, for your example. Help us to be compassionate to others. Thank you for our fathers, and we pray your mercies on them. Amen. All right, that's my message. I don't know.